Okay, Lisa, we are full. The session has 1,000 participants at the moment. Okay. So, um, uh, I think pretty clear we're going to have to either do this again or we'll go <laughs> through. Um, so welcome, everyone. This is our first run at the Bill 44 Amendments to the Strata Property Act, which essentially came into effect on the evening of November 24th. Um, they um, were published on the 25th. Um, we've since distributed them all. Lisa Mackey from Alexander Holborn and um, myself, we're going to walk you through them along with the questions. Just give everybody a quick little update. We are recording this webinar, so you can review it. Um, the PowerPoint will be available with it. It'll be on the Chua, Choa YouTube channel um, and everyone will have full access to it. And you're welcome to distribute the link to any of your fellow strata councils, property managers, um, real estate agents, anyone who you think might benefit from it. Um, if you've asked a question, uh, please refrain from identifying any of your personal information. Um, we um, try to protect the privacy of everyone who has participated. Um, the Q&A platform is used for questions. It's not used for debate or more concerned, uh, inappropriate behavior or offensive language. Um, if that occurs, the um, facilitator, who is Daryl, will remove the person from the webinar. Uh, and the um, it's, the session is for educational purposes only. Um, there's probably still a few unknowns that we are going to be facing, um, but within that, um, we'll try to capture as much information as possible. I anticipate within a month, we'll do an update on this session as well. So Lisa, let's just start right in and um, get right through it. Okay, yeah, and it's a lot to get through everybody. And I should say, I'm struggling with a bit of a cough today, but I've uh, been joking around that I'm just trying to catch my breath with all of these sudden amendments. So uh, we're with you. Um, key overview of the changes uh, that have come into play from the passing of Bill 44. So um, breaking news, rental bylaws are no longer enforceable. That is taking immediate effect as of the time that Bill 44 received uh, royal assent. Uh, the only permitted age restriction bylaws that we can pass in our communities is for 55 years and over. Uh, and electronic meetings are now permitted without the need for a bylaw. So um, that is some welcome news. I know that a couple of other amendments were not, but we'll, uh, we'll work through this together. Uh, no restriction of rentals by strata corporation. So this is the one that has been generating a lot of buzz. Um, the new section of the Strata Property Act reads the Strata Corporation must not screen tenants, establish screening criteria, require the approval of tenants, require the insertion of terms and tenancy agreements, or otherwise restrict the rental of a strata lot. So various sections that we were um, uh, uh, dealing with before in terms of regulating and restricting rentals in our communities um, have been repealed. Uh, and the important messaging here is that uh, no restrictions of long-term rentals, uh, i.e. those that are most likely covered under the Residential Tenancy Act are permitted anymore. Uh, and what does this mean? Well, this applies to everybody. So uh, no matter the nature of your strata corporation, if it's bare land or not, um, all strata corporations uh, are not uh, permitted anymore to uh, regulate or restrict the number of rentals in your community. Um, the Form K is still alive and kicking, and that's an important form that we'll um, know and love from before. Uh, it's a document that tenants need to sign um, uh, along with the owner that acknowledges that they've received a copy of the bylaws and they agree to abide by the bylaws as amended from time to time in the strata community. Those apply to all rentals now. Um, the Strata Corporation can continue um, in its usual course of collecting tenant contact information as well. Owners are entitled to receive that information as well as uh, prospective purchasers uh, when they're considering buying in communities. We'll get to that a little bit. Um, and bylaw enforcement, just a reminder, if it deals with uh, tenant conduct or behavior, uh, the, apply, the process, the bylaw enforcement process still applies to tenants. It must also include their landlords and owners in that process to remain enforceable. Other repeals. So um, we've got uh, section 59.3 sub 1 and 4 and C is repealed as well. Um, this means that Form B information certificates uh, will no longer disclose uh, rentals in our community. Um, now, caveat to that, buyers are still entitled to know the, the lay of the land, so to speak. Um, and so they are allowed to request a list of owners and tenants under 
uh, Section 35 of the Strata Property Act. Certainly an owner can request it for a prospective purchaser or those authorized by the owner. Um, and uh, this will come as no surprise, but the uh, rental disclosure statements that owner developers used to file no longer apply. So um, we don't need to worry about pre-2010 uh, disclosure statements versus uh, post-2010 disclosure statements. Um, does this apply to short-term accommodations? Now, I've often heard the expression short-term rentals, uh, and that's sort of a bad phrase to use because short-term accommodations like Airbnb, VRBO, um, anything used for travel or temporary uh, accommodation for recreational purposes, uh, those are not rentals in the strictest sense. They're not tenancies. So uh, the laws around the ability for strata corporations to continue to restrict those activities remain. Those that remain unaffected. Um, strata corporations can still pass bylaws that um, prohibit uh, short-term accommodations. Um, typically, short-term accommodations are defined as uh, a stay of um, 30 consecutive uh, days uh, or less than that. Um, and uh, that's the city of Vancouver's interpretation. Each municipality has their own as well as some other business licensing requirements as well. Um, but strata corporations are still free to prohibit these activities, which are commercial activities. Uh, and you're still allowed, subject to your bylaws and amending them to get the full fining restriction, you're still allowed to fine up to $1,000 a day um, if your short-term accommodation bylaws are violated. Uh, age restrictions. So apart from the blur that we've had to endure um, for uh, the changes to our ability to navigate uh, rental bylaws and, and the evaporation of that right now, um, we also have um, changes to our age restriction bylaws. So now um, it is not permitted for a strata corporation to pass an age restriction uh, unless it pertains to somebody who has uh, reached 55 years of age or older. So um, the legislation affords housing that is geared towards senior developments, um, but uh, the right of a strata corporation um, to pass a bylaw of, uh, for example, requiring occupants to be 19 years of age or older is no longer permitted and it's immediately unenforceable. Uh, the unenforceability of the bylaw continues. So the legislation has carved out two classes of uh, persons that will still be exempt from an otherwise uh, valid age restriction bylaw of 55 years or older. And they've also left room in the, uh, in the act to authorize more prescribed classes of, of exemptions in the future. So stay tuned from future, for future claims um, uh, or changes to the regulations that would enable um, more exemptions. So that's to come, we're all staying tuned for that. But for the time being, we have two classes. So the first class is somebody who lives in the strata lot immediately before you pass your bylaw. Um, by residing in the strata lot, they didn't contravene any bylaw restricting age in the strata lot, and they continue to live in the strata lot after the bylaw is passed. So uh, same sort of uh, uh, protocol that we had before in terms of making sure that those that were occupying a strata lot at the time the 55 year in age uh, restriction was passed are protected. Um, it means that any newbies coming in, so they're not allowed to bring in a 30 year old roommate, they are protected. Um, but, uh, but that is a, a, a class of exemption we need to keep in mind. So um, your bylaw is not enforceable immediately um, against those persons. It applies to new persons that come into that property. And then we have a special exemption for caregivers. Uh, now, anybody who's had any um, uh, relationship with the human rights code on this will be well familiar with that. So uh, the laws under the Strata Property Act have been amended to recognize that those that are acting as a caregiver, so those providing care to another person who lives in a strata uh, lot, and um, the person receiving care depends on them, um, for their direction or assistance with respect to their own disability, illness, or frailty, those caregivers are exempt as well. So we cannot enforce a bylaw against um, an individual who provides care uh, to persons residing in the, strata in the strata lot at the time. Okay, so now that we, uh, we tackled the uh, changes to age restrictions, let's move on to electronic meetings. So this will be a welcome change um, to a lot of strata corporations, although many strata corporations over the last couple of years have already adopted bylaws that enable electronic meetings. Uh, now you don't need one. 
So uh, the uh, new Strata Property Act provisions will authorize Strata corporations to uh, conduct voting and attendance at special general meetings and annual general meetings by telephone um, or by other electronic means. And we know what that means, Zoom, um, Teams, any other um, form of electronic attendance that enables everyone to communicate with one another. Now, there are certain requirements for this. Um, in your strata corporation, your general meeting notice needs to include instructions for how people can attend. Um, the electronic means has to enable everyone to be able to communicate with each other. And it needs to enable the chairperson to be able to identify um, the uh, person attending by electronic means is indeed an eligible voter as well. Now, despite these bylaws, um, we do have um, uh, some other changes as well. And this is uh, overrides whatever bylaws your community might have already passed with respect to electronic meetings. Um, the Strata Property Act provides now that a voting card is not required to be issued to an eligible voter who attends a general meeting uh, by electronic means. That eligible voter who attends by electronic means is not entitled to nor required to any secret ballots. Uh, and the person attending via electronic means are deemed to be present in person at the general meeting as well. So there's no distinction between those that zoom into the meeting and those that attend in person. So the implications, uh, no secret ballots uh, at electronic meetings. This was always a hassle for everybody in terms of how do we navigate uh, secret ballots in an electronic format. We've all been uh, developing creative protocol for that. Um, no longer required, so we don't need to worry about it there. Um, again, the chairperson must still be able to identify the person dialing in or zooming in that they're eligible to vote. Voting cards are no longer required. And again, uh, just because you're dialing in or attending by electronic means or by telephone doesn't mean that you're not considered to be attending in person, you are. Okay, okay. Yeah. so yeah. jump into questions right away, and I already have some additions to add from what we've already published here <laughs> Perfect. from the pre ones. So, um, and I know people are flooding with a lot of Q and A, um, but let's go through these questions first, and the two that I just got by email, which I think are um, fairly critical, and they're going to probably open the door um, on misinterpretations. So, you know, the the real question that a lot, we've had a lot of in the last week, especially from small stratas that are 55 and over, is the, does this really mean that their rental bylaw for 55 and over, um, mm -hmm. it no longer applies? Um, and I, the reality is yes. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. So the rental bylaws are no longer there. Now, your age bylaws and your age restrictions could apply, again, to any occupant. So look at the language of your bylaw. Does your, does your bylaw restrict any occupant to 55 years and age of older? You're allowed to do that. Um, so you might have the need to go and resuscitate your bylaws, have a look, see if it needs any tinkering. But yes, any rental restriction bylaws are no longer in play anymore, everybody. So um, they're immediately unenforceable. Um, a follow-up question um, that goes con in connection with this is that we've had several inquiries wanting to know whether a strata could adopt a bylaw that would set very specific conditions or qualifications of a caregiver. Mm, interesting. And, and we've got a little bit of a to be determined uh, on that because the legislation is drafted quite broadly right now. It says that the person um, is a caregiver if, they, uh, if the purpose of their residency is to provide care for another person for their age or for their frailty, disability um, or illness. And so the word purpose is intentionally broad. So what does that mean? Can a strata corporation narrow the definition of what it considers to be a purpose? Um, I've already received one question from somebody saying, what if somebody has a younger spouse? So we're in a 55 year and older complex, they've married a 19 year old, um, what does that mean if they're providing care? And so uh, I would be careful uh, in terms of how you um, uh, adjust your bylaws to define what a caregiver means. Uh, I think we'll get more guidance, frankly, from the Civil Resolution Tribunal as they work through um, these uh, amendments as well. Um, it's not to say that you can't define uh, what purpose means in your community, but I think we need to wait and see how these, um, uh, these amendments are interpreted. Well, this would also open the door possibly on claim, um, com complaints under the Human Rights Code as well. 
Absolutely. And they were already there. And this is this is what's um, uh, interesting and, and why I say that if anyone was ever familiar with the Human Rights Code before, this will not really come as a surprise in terms of requested for uh, accommodations for caregivers. Um, under the Human Rights Code, that's what I affectionately call the yeah, but law. Um, yes, we're allowed to do certain things as a strata corporation, but we have a duty to accommodate um, persons for their protected grounds. And that can include physical and mental disability. Um, it can, uh, can include uh, characteristics that require um, ongoing uh, care from somebody who is younger and doesn't meet the, the age requirements in your community. So, so those accommodations were already there. I think the Strata Property Act is just reinforcing that protection as it comes to older adults. We have a 45 and over bylaw. Is there any grandfathering in place for existing age bylaws? No. So Short every, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, uh, and everybody is, uh, is catching their breath on this. So overnight we have, um, completely eradicated any bylaw that is, uh, limiting to anybody, um, younger than 55 years of age. Uh, they are immediately unenforceable. There's no transition period. Um, it's a shame because, uh, us and strata corporations are catching up on these amendments um, and trying our best to be able to um, uh, maintain a community that we, we thought we were buying into. Um, but uh, no, any bylaw that we have that offends the Strata Property Act is offensive and, and therefore unenforceable. And what's interesting is our offices across the province have been overwhelmed by strata corporations with 45 and over bylaws mm -hmm. geared predominantly towards mature adults. Um, who are now asking, um, how quickly can we adopt a 55 and over bylaw? Uh, and yeah. that, that is the transition that I can foresee. And that will come with consequences and some implications for our industry. Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of communities now are scrambling, frankly, uh, quite literally, to pass an enforceable age restriction bylaw so that they can at least preserve um, what they're permitted to preserve under the Strata Property Act. And that's the speed of getting your notice package together um, and uh, and getting that three-quarter vote approval and then registering your bylaw amendment with the um, land title office as well. So this is a, this is a lot of scrambling. And I, I appreciate the, the frustration and questions that have been pouring in uh, on all of these amendments. So will the ban on rental restrictions now enable an owner of a large rental suite to turn it into a single room occupancy rental for multiple tenants? And I think this is a concern that we've already seen um, as a result of court actions in the province, but I think this is a concern probably growing for a number of complexes. Yes, I agree. And I think um, we need to evaluate the, again, what the property is being used for. So is it properly construed as a rental or is it something called a license to occupy? Is it a short term accommodation? What is it? Um, so we need to evaluate each uh, rental, uh, alleged rental on a case by case basis. Um, if an owner is renting out rooms for a short period of time, um, and for example, you're in the city of Vancouver, there are less than 30-day uh, periods of rentals, uh, and it starts to look like a hotel operation, um, then it probably is one, and it probably is something that can be restricted in your community. But we need to dial in to the specifics of, of every uh, purported rental to see whether or not the, these protections actually um, apply to that owner. Are they, are they truly uh, doing what the government has encouraged, which is to facilitate more long-term housing stock? Can we adopt a bylaw that states tenancy agreements must be of no less than 12 months or even greater? And I think this gets expanded into, can the Strata Corporation, it, while they can't prohibit rentals, can they adopt a bylaw that somehow regulates or controls rentals? Well, this is where we're going to get our creative uh, thinking caps on. How far can we go uh, to be able to regulate um, rental activities? Now, remember, the Strata Property Act still has that restriction to say a strata corporation cannot insert a term in a tenancy agreement, um, cannot tenant screen, um, can't otherwise interfere with a rental. So on first blush, I'll be very, very careful to say that um, rentals are only permitted if they're a certain period of time. Uh, unless you can say that uh, you consider a short-term accommodation to be defined as this period or less, again, playing within the language of the legislation there. Um, but I would be very, very cautious to pass a bylaw where we are inserting 
um, a fixed term tenancy requirement into tenancy agreements. Because keep in mind, um, the laws around fixed term tenancies under the Resid Residential Tenancy Act changed significantly as well over the last two years, just in case you were wondering um, about uh, that area of the law. It's also been undergoing um, some shift recently. Um, and so uh, any, but I would, I would say that any argument that we are somehow imposing a requirement for landlords or owners to put into their leases certain requirements, um, we're on shaky ground here. I would be much more comfortable defining what the Strata Corporation considers to be a short-term accommodation. Um, so in tied into this, we have quite a few properties across the province and they're generally in um, tourist areas, resort accommodations, mm -hmm. um, hotels um, that have either fractional interests, timeshares, but they're all strata titled. Um, mm -hmm. But in these communities, what we have is we have covenants limiting or restricting the use of rental versus personal use. Um, so the Strata Property Act in this capacity has a little bit of collision, but the covenants will prevail. I, I'm going to assume they, that these covenants continue to take precedence. I would assume as well. So, I, so keep in mind, this is really targeted at Strata Corporation bylaws. It isn't a reflection on what is registered on title in terms of the, the makeup of the Strata Corporation. So I tend to agree with you, Tony. Um, but we're all in a little bit of a, a wait and see. I think there's going to be a lot of um, discussion that folds, uh, unfolds at the CRT over this and a discussion by way of decision, um, and as well as the Supreme Court in terms of how uh, far reaching these amendments uh, are. But I tend to agree with you that a covenant should be shielded from this. Yeah, it, 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 it's really going to be the next six months to a year. You know, obviously, as an association with all of our members in the public, we're going to closely monitor the changing industry and the dynamics in the industry because we work with government as closely as possible. Um, but that as we go through this, um, I think it's it's going to be um, time will tell what, what the real impact and what the real consequences of this change are going to be, especially after almost 60 years of rental bylaws. I agree. It's, it's a huge shift. Um, I found it very interesting that the amendments allowed for a transition period with respect to electronic meetings and notice requirements. So there was an acknowledgement there that a lot of notice packages have gone out the door that may not comply strictly with what the Act requires now. So there was some preparation time for strata corporations there, but we're all left with zero preparation time when it comes to the uh, inability to um, uh, regulate rentals in our community or our age restriction bylaws. So a very abrupt adjustment for everybody. Um, and, uh, and we're all in this together, so to speak. So we'll see what happens um, in, the, in the foreseeable future on this. So if we adopt a 55 and over bylaw, when does the bylaw come into it? effect and our existing residents exempt. Um, you've already talked about this, but I think it's mm -hmm. worth kind of re-emphasizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's protection. So those that are already there um, living at the time that the bylaw was passed, they're exempt. Now it doesn't allow an exemption for the strata lot. It's just the people. Um, and so the existing persons would uh, not have um, an immediate um, application under those otherwise valid age restriction bylaws that take effect after you've called your general meeting, you've voted on it, you've passed it by a three-quarter vote, you've registered it. Don't forget to register with the land title office after all of that. Um, but uh, there is protection for existing residents um, under those bylaws as well. So, um, but again, it's not carte blanche. So it doesn't mean that the strata lot is allowed to invite um, younger folks in <laughs> as well, unless they meet um, the caregiver uh, exemption. Um, but there are protections available. So there, there is a, a delaying um, effect uh, with respect to otherwise a valid bylaw now. Oh, so here's the, the million dollar question, I think. And this is yeah. a problem that strata corporations frequently have because the landlord doesn't control, obviously, what tenants will do. Um, but if we can't limit rentals, can we prohibit subletting by tenants? Mm. So um, a sublease is still a lease. It's a tenancy agreement. So what people need to keep in mind is when we're talking about subleases, it's a scenario where a landlord leases to a tenant and a tenant subleases to their tenant, also um, known as a subtenant. 
So again, I would be very, very cautious for strata corporations if it looks like we are inserting terms into tenancy agreements that prohibit subletting um, and otherwise interfere with legal rights under another statute called the Residential Tenancy Act. So the Residential Tenancy Act actually allows uh, tenants to be able to request the permission to sublet from uh, or assign their leases uh, to other people um, if they're six months or more remaining under a fixed term lease. A strata, uh, landlord is not able to unreasonably deny those requests. So there's other protections in play here under the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, but my uh, knee-jerk reaction to this is as soon as we start interfering with the lease and fundamentally we're making changes that should be reflected in the, the written tenancy agreement itself, then we're going to be encountering some enforceability problems there. Um, and unfortunately, there was a, a blog site I came across on the weekend um, where um, an individual quoting a property manager said that the new laws have basically rendered all of our bylaws unenforceable. <laughs> Not true at all. <laughs> um, you know, really, uh, rentals, age, and electronic meetings are the only effects that this that these amendments um, have with respects to strata corporation bylaws. Um, so all of the other bylaws, they're still in effect. Um, but I, you know, going back to this, I think this is time where everybody gets their game up here. Mm -hmm. uh, strata councils, property owners, um, to understand that tenants can be fined. And if the tenants are not being cooperative, um, the landlord um, or owner of the strata lot can ultimately, ultimately be responsible for these expenses. But we have to include everyone in the bylaw enforcement process. That's right. And I always remind folks that tenants are people too. <laughs> So uh, they're not a subclass of, of residents in a strata corporation. They're another person. Um, they're responsible for adhering to the bylaws as amended from time to time. Um, and uh, so all of our bylaws, our pet bylaws, our noise bylaws, every property use bylaw still applies to tenants. Um, and uh, to your point, Tony, we do need to up our game. So we have to follow strictly Section 135 of the Strata Property Act that says that people need to get notice of a uh, purported bylaw infraction and an opportunity to respond. So those notices need to go to the tenants. They need to go to the owner, um, landlord. Um, of that tenancy as well. Everyone has an opportunity to respond. So uh, we need to do a bit of housekeeping here. We, we need to make sure that when we do have uh, encounter bylaw um, issues uh, with our renters, that we strictly follow the, the bylaw enforcement proceedings under the Act. And, and we apply them the same to a tenant as we do to any owner or occupant who may have violated the bylaws. I think big message here, it's absolutely essential to ensure that your owner tenant lists are up to date. Understand who's living in the units, um, who the occupants are, um, you know, the details of the number of occupants or who the other occupants are in the, um, in the unit are not really within the scope of authority of the Strata Corporation um, as a requirement to collect. But having um, a clear understanding of which units have tenants, which units have owners is going to be really essential. I think a lot of people are going to be surprised to discover there are a lot more tenants in their buildings than they thought there were. Mm. Uh, and, 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 you know, in, in retirement communities, um, there are a significant number of retired persons living in the units that have been treated or understood as owners. They're not owners. The mm -hmm. family own the units. And as a family exemption, they've been there um, as a family, family occupant. So, you know, understanding the relationship and making sure that all the parties are communicated with will only work if your owner lists are up to date. Absolutely. And we need to mind our P's and Q's on Form K's. <laughs> so uh, let's make sure that all our Form K's are there and collected. So this is a really important document. It's a document where a tenant acknowledges that they're, they've received a copy of the bylaws, that they agree to comply with the bylaws. Uh, and many strata corporations um, have uh, started to pass bylaws to say that uh, uh, the failure to sign a Form K, so an owner's failure to notify a strata corporation that they're renting their property, um, or a failure of a tenant um, to sign a Form K um, is a violation of a significant bylaw or rule in the community. Um, and that language becomes really important later when it comes to a strata corporation's ability to evict a tenant for repeatedly uh, breach, uh, breaching a significant bylaw or rule in a community. We need to stay on top of our Form Ks and we wanna make sure that we know, as, as you say, who is living the, in the community. 
Um, do so, you know, I think this is a housekeeping issue more than mm. anything. Um, and there are two separate questions here, but um, do we need to repeal our rental bylaws? Well, I think by virtue of legislation, they've just been repealed. Um, so that's one thing. But, you know, I think a recommendation would be this might be an appropriate time as we move forward. Next time you do a bylaw update, clean them up, get rid of the things that no longer apply or that are effective. Absolutely. Use this as an opportunity. Um, so look into your age restriction bylaw at, at this point. Look into your electronic meetings um, bylaws at this point. Um, remember that the, the laws changed around electronic meetings uh, and, and what how these meetings can be conducted now. So um, the, the laws change uh, and sometimes as we've just witnessed without any notice at all. Um, but what we can do in our communities is we can engage in bylaw reviews and make sure that we clean up um, the bylaws that no longer apply. Um, I, I agree with you. The repeal has already been done. <laughs> so it's just a, it's a useless accessory right now in your uh, land title office registrations. Um, but in terms of giving an accurate depiction of what bylaws are enforceable or not, I think removing them um, is, is a good thing. And the other part of this is, can we require a landlord to use a licensed rental agent? Um, that would be a perfect world so that there'd be some valid screening of tenants, but that would again be an, an insertion into a condition on tenancy and rentals, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And so, so no, we can't require somebody um, to retain a, a licensed rental property manager. We want them to. We'd want them to get more involved or at least dialed in um, to who's living in the property. Um, I think there is a a tension between opening up rental housing and opening up responsible rental housing. And there's a distinguishing, uh, there's a big gap between the two. Just because you're allowed to rent doesn't mean that you might rent responsibly or not. Um, uh, but there are consequences to owners who do not supervise their tenants, who allow people to come in um, that violate the bylaws or um, create property damage or other nuisance. Um, so they will be accountable. But unfortunately, uh, we just don't have that ability to mandate training or um, require anybody to have uh, um, uh, a certain level of oversight over their housing. Well, and I can pretty much with confidence state that after 25 years of interaction in this industry, with all of the problems and the issues that arise, a problem owner almost guarantees you're going to have a problem landlord, uh, tenant mm. when they rent. Um, mm. There are, there are just, you know, 99% of the tenants are outstanding. They're great. They interact, they form the communities. They are incredible to work with. It's not an issue, but a problem landlord almost always results in problem tenants at the same time. Absolutely. Can Estrada, oh, here we get to the real, you know, Ooh. meat and potatoes <laughs> problem that, that nobody really knows what this, how this is going to turn out, <laughs> right? This is going to be, everyone be patient. There's going to be a fair amount of evolution here. Um, but can Estrada Corporation evict a problem tenant and under what circumstances? Yeah, so we've always had that ability, or at least it seems like that. Uh, we've we've had that ability under the Strata Property Act before. So when, when an, a tenant has violated a significant bylaw or rule um, uh, repeatedly, um, a strata corporation can essentially step into the shoes of a landlord and issue an eviction notice. Um, and it would be akin to one that's under section 47 of the Residential Tenancy Act, which is a one month notice to end tenancy for cause. But there was always this tension uh, in terms of where strata corporations could go to um, enforce their eviction notices that they're dispensing. Not to mention the fact that the residential tenancy branch still um, doesn't have a form that strata corporations can cleanly use. There isn't one designed specific for strata corporation evictions versus landlord evictions. Um, so what has happened uh, to uh, open the door, uh, so to speak, to strata corporations um, to uh, expedite or purportedly expedite um, evictions is the residential tenancy branch has now been encouraged by way of a policy guideline to entertain evictions commenced by strata corporations uh, under the Strata Property Act. So a strata corporation under the policy guideline is uh, being considered to be one of the eligible landlords um, within the meaning of the Strata Property Act um, and the definition of landlord under the Residential Tenancy Act to come in and go to the residential tenancy branch to enforce a one month notice to end tenancy for cause. Now, word of caution there, and I do think, Tony, this is a bit of a crystal ball gaze because we're going to have to figure out how they reconcile the jurisdictional challenges under the Residential Tenancy Act 
with um, the, the notion that the act really is only intended to provide the director of the branch with authority to deal with landlord and tenant disputes. Um, and the definition of landlord, uh, at least as enumerated under the act, doesn't contemplate a strata corporation. Uh, the whole concept of a rental doesn't contemplate the involvement of a strata corporation. So I do think we're going to get more amendments there. I think uh, a policy guideline won't be enough to open that door all the way. Um, but, uh, but certainly arbitrators at the branch are now being encouraged to consider applications by strata corporations to enforce an eviction notice. Um, but a word of caution, the guideline provides a lot of exits for an arbitrator to adjourn or to dismiss an application for an eviction by a strata. And part of that is a qualitative assessment. If the strata corporation approached the branch as a last resort, have they gone to the CRT for enforcement first? Um, and if a tenant challenges the enforceability of a bylaw that they are being evicted under, um, then the RTB is, is uh, being encouraged to adjourn until that bylaw can be determined as being enforceable or unenforceable through the CRT. So we're talking about a very windy road, everybody. Um, uh, I think that road will change. I think our roadmap will change. Um, but the notion that the strata corporation has that ability to evict, um, that's still there. It's, but it's a question mark in terms of uh, how successfully we can get through at the branch to expedite an eviction. And, and we have to step back and remember that bylaw enforcement is about changing behavior mm -hmm. into functional community compliance. It's not about fining, penalizing, or evicting. Um, but it is a critical step in the process as you move forward if you do have a serious tenant problem that may result in eviction. So, you know, we're, I think we'll, we'll revisit these sessions, these webinars um, on a monthly basis starting January um, to make sure that strata corporations and property managers have a really clear understanding um, about the essence of record keeping, decision making, proper notice, um, proper enforcement of bylaws, equitable enforcement of bylaws, and that tenants are not treated any differently than a mm -hmm. resident owner is treated, which, which is a bit of a problem in buildings. Mm -hmm. No, and the first resort to address a problem tenant isn't eviction. And that's been made clear by the policy guideline updates at the branch. Um, they expect the strata corporation to try and work through the problem first. Um, and those tools are under 135 of the Strata Property Act, and we need to make sure that we use those tools effectively and appropriately. Uh, so here's pending mm -hmm. a number of CRT applications and bylaw enforcement issues. The Strata's in the port process of enforcing a rental bylaw. Does it all simply get cancelled now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the verdict is all of this has become moot now, hasn't it? Um, the, the amendments take immediate effect. So you might be underway um, with legal proceedings. You might be before the Human Rights Tribunal. You might be before the Civil Resolution Tribunal. You might be before the Supreme Court. This has changed everything. There is no transition period for ongoing uh, litigation or bylaw enforcement. Um, we're starting from scratch, everybody. So um, uh, yes, if we are in the process of enforcing our rental bylaw, um, that process is, is coming to an end. It has come to an end already. So we we do have time for a few more questions. I've just done a scan of the Q and A and it looks sure. like we pretty much covered everything, um, through topic, but I, I do have two more questions that have come up that I think are essential. Just want to remind everybody that we've recorded this session, the legislations on the CHOA website, as well as the BC government website. You'll get links for both of them. Uh, there's a number of Q&A formats. Um, current versions of the Strata Property Act are going to be available through the CHOA office. So if you want a paper version of this, King's Printer are in the process of upgrading their legislation. So all the amendments and changes are there um, for access for the public. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, um, you know, reach out to us. We're happy to do it. Um, I'm, I would put you out um, as a sacrificial lamb, Lisa, but I think <laughs> the fact that, we, that we're way over capacity um, on participants, I think that um, you would 
probably find your days just totally consumed. So start, <laughs> start with one of our advisors in the offices. Um, on electronic meetings, um, we now have several companies who do electronic platforms for voting. And so the question has come up and, and we're doing we're doing a session this week on the for the parliamentarians of BC. Um, but the you know in looking at it closely, um, strata corporations will still be able to use electronic platforms. But when you look at the language where it says that the chairperson has to be able to identify eligible voters, take this to the next level. You have to know who's voting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what, this is one of the reasons why um, secret ballots have been removed, because we found on most electronic meetings to have effective, accurate voting, we call the role of those people who are present at the meeting in person or by proxy. This way, as the chairperson, you have control and understand that who is voting um, and the outcomes of the votes. I think this is absolutely critical for bylaw amendments, special levies, for windups of strata corporations, anything that requires a, a three quarters, 80% or unanimous vote. I think if you're doing electronic meetings, you're gonna to want to apply a really high level of scrutiny to identifying who is voting as the eligible voters during the meeting. But there's nothing preventing a strata corporation, um, and I encourage them to continue to use some sort of electronic platforms if you find this makes your job easier as you go forward. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's a matter of seeing what works, um, and uh, and certainly the the standard um, has been elevated by the act to to remind us that we need to be able to to confirm. Um, whether or not somebody voting on the other end of the phone or, or the other end of the computer screen is eligible to vote. So um, as uh, Tony, as you mentioned at the front end, um, this is really a, uh, a time for us to buckle down and make sure that we have our procedures in order uh, and make sure that we are, are, are being very, very careful about how we run these meetings. And we see now also a number of hybrid meetings where we'll have 30 or 40 people in the club room, but we also have a digital monitor, uh, which is hooked up to a Zoom meeting, which enables the balance of people to attend electronically from remote locations, um, or if they're not comfortable being in groups yet uh, to do that. Those work incredibly well at the same time. The message here is for the chairperson, whoever you are, you have to be able to identify all of the eligible voters in person or by proxy. Because if you can't do that, it is going to be suspect whether your, your votes were in fact passed correctly or not. Mm -hmm. um, Daryl, um, I know you've been monitoring the q and I think we've covered, I've gone through and scanned through, I think we've covered everything. Um, we're certainly going to monitor this closely. Uh, there's one other question that is in the back of my mind that I know people keep raising. Um, and the question is, is there some way for the public to challenge this? Uh, especially the rental bylaws. Can we challenge as a strata corporation um, the um, enforceability of this amendment or this change? Uh, and that would come in some form of constitutional or class action um, filing against this. Um, Lisa and I were talking about this earlier, and Lisa, I'll let you expand on this, but I was just calculating out in normal class actions or constitutional challenges. Just by the time you are organize the arguments, you fund the project, you evaluate whether it's feasible or not, and then you make your application for certification, years will go by. And that's the real challenge here is that by the time we would actually get to a hearing or a decision in this process, three to five years will have gone by and this industry will have changed dynamically anyhow. Yeah, I mean, the process is not quick. Um, the process is complicated. Um, it's no different than any other specialty in law as well. So we're not dealing with a lawyer that um, is just familiar with the Strata Property Act. It needs to be a lawyer that is familiar with class actions or constitutional law, which is a whole other layer. Um, so be very, very careful in your communities if you want to invest uh, time and expense um, to embark on a challenge. It will be, uh, spoiler alert, challenging. Uh, and so I think in terms of immediate next steps, um, I would encourage councils to look at how your communities can grapple with the existing amendments. Um, again, I appreciate the frustration that we had no notice of these changes uh, and no real time or transition on, on much of these changes. Um, but we're all in this together. And I think uh, we need to start rowing in the same direction. Absolutely. So any way we can help reach out and we'll be happy to assist. Lisa, thanks a million, uh, much appreciated. Uh, everyone stand by. 
Um, if you've discovered information that is impacting your strata as a result of these changes, please send us an email. It'll be helpful to keep government informed as we move forward. Um, there may be other changes in legislation that could be potential that can help us through this. So um, keep us informed. Send us an email. Um, we're, we're chalking up thousands a day right now. So, you know, it's taking a while to weave through them all. But thanks so much, Lisa. And thanks, everyone, for attending. This session is recorded. It will be posted along with the presentation to the YouTube channel. And everyone have a great day.